You give Teller from Jerusalem 20 minutes, and he'll give you the education of a lifetime. King of the storytellers and the Shakespeare of the Torah world, here is Rabbi Hanok Teller. Good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are. You're so welcome to episode number four of Teller from Jerusalem. And today we have a special treat for you. Today is our inauguration of our once a month talk about character. And I want to give proper credit in the beginning. I want to thank, I want to think, I'd love to think, that what I'm about to say is a result of a lifetime of study of biblical subjects, uh, and perhaps it is to some extent, but that's in the general. In the Pacific, I am especially grateful to the masterwork written by Rabbi Joseph Telushkin called A Code of Jewish Ethics, and I want to show the camera what this looks like. And, well, you don't see much, but thanks to my... Uh, Consulting this book so often, you can't see a thing here. All it is is markings and there's nothing here. It's a wreck. It's falling apart. In any event, uh, the book is a masterpiece. And looking at the condition of the book, it gives you an indication of how often I've consulted it. By the way, don't be confused by the title, Code of Jewish Ethics, just like that very famous Levi's Jewish rye bread advertisement. You don't have to be Jewish to love Levi's Jewish bread, which shows a, a Native American and an Irish cop and an African American enjoying Levi's rye bread. You don't have to be Jewish to enjoy what we're going to be teaching about character and civility. Our background. Uh, according to what Jewish law teaches is that the idea is to become a better person. The point of life is to become a better person. And if not, then you have failed. Failed what? Failed life. That's a bummer. Everyone knows. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Everyone knows. You can fail a test and not flunk the course. But flunking life, that's a bummer. Or more specifically, if at the age of 60, you're not more compassionate, endearing, helpful, pleasant, polite, then you were at the age of 20, you have failed. But as we all know, a plane which flies from New York to Los Angeles, 85% of the route, it's been constantly, dynamically, perpetually being vectored back on course. But the bottom line is it lands in the right, right, in the right airport, in the right runway, in the right city, it's 100% success. Falling down is not a mistake, we know this. Staying down is a mistake. The gym where I work out, it is staffed by Russians that are here I am in Israel. It's staffed by Russians that are Hebrew challenged. So I was trying to go from the squash court to the pool without getting changed and dressed. And one of them caught me and he said to me, he said to me, Atataut, which translates, you are a mistake. I'm still thinking about this. But again, falling down is not a mistake. Staying down, that's a mistake. Man's default is not to refine and become a more dignified individual. As the Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, man's heart is evil from youth. A person's nature is evil from youth. Which means that man received the evil inclination from birth before he has the wisdom or the maturity to combat it. In other words, man's animal instincts are inborn while the intellect and the spiritual desire for self-improvement must be acquired and inculcated with time and maturity. I am a senior docent in Yad Vashem. I am a tour guide in the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem. And the way Yad Vashem is set up, you begin by walking through what's called the promenade of the righteous Gentile to commemorate those non-Jews who risked their lives, and actually their lives and the lives of their families, to save Jews during the war. They were an extremely small percentage. Barely is a percentage. I took their numbers into my daughter's sophisticated high school calculator and divided by the number of non-Jews living in Europe, and the computer could not even calculate a number. So we're talking about extremely small percentage. But in any event, these are righteous, pious people. So you have the prominent of the righteous Gentile, which then matches up with the path which leads into the Holocaust Museum. And I always say that these are two parallel paths in a desperate race against time. 
And perhaps you know, there are people who like to put up in their homes pictures of people that they admire. A picture of Maimonides, the Chafetz Chaim, these are rabbinic sages, or of David Jeremiah, or of Albert Moeller, or Mother Teresa. But why is it you'll never find in a home a picture of Brussels sprouts? And when you think about it, Brussels sprouts are squeaky clean. They never murdered, raped, extorted, embezzled, never did anything wrong. And the answer is, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We appreciate people who've mounted challenges. We appreciate people who walk the same streets that we walk, breathe the same air that we breathe, and achieve such high levels. A Brussels sprout and a lima bean and a petunia was never challenged, so therefore there's no admiration for them. The fact of the matter is, is that the Nazis, they are not the aberration. We are taught from the time we're children by our parents to fight our nature, to be honorable people, distinct people that are kind and caring and honorable. But if you don't fight that nature, and in education, and here I'm referring specifically to religious education, because to the best of my knowledge, public school will not teach you to be a better refined individual. They'll teach you algebra and civics and social studies and history, but they will not teach you moral sensitivity. So it's possible to go through high school and come out very knowledgeable, but be an ignoramus in civility and in character. So, but we're taught from the time we're children by our parents and by, if it's religious education, how to muster and how to overcome that nature so it cannot rule us, but we will rule over it. In the world to come, they don't want checks. They want receipts. One becomes a good person not through thoughts. There's nothing wrong with good thoughts. But much more important are good actions. Actions shape the heart. The rabbinic view is, is that the heart is much more shaped by actions than, than actions shape the heart. Factually, when people are eulogized, they're always eulogized for what they accomplished, not for their intentions, unless the tragic incident where someone died very prematurely was never able to actualize what they intended to do. But we are eulogized by what we accomplished, not by our thoughts. No one wants to be remembered that they had the most beautiful counters that were so clean, or that they had the most manicured lawn, or that you could see the reflection in the hood of the car. The death regret is never, Oish, I wish I would have spent more time in the office. The regret is, I wish I would have spent more time with the family. How do you wish to be remembered? David Brooks, the New York Times op-ed op editorial writer, described it as, there are resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Resume virtues are career achievements, professional skills, degrees, and eulogy virtues are kindness, time spent with loved ones, and the priority of family and the priority of faith. Dr. David Pelkovitz, one of my super favorites, he's a very accomplished psychologist, always has important things to say. He once mentioned that his uncle Nathan Pelkovitz was a very prominent and accomplished uh, officer in the United States Air Force in World War II. He was a uh, versed in many languages, he interrogated prisoners in German, and then after the war he became director of United Nations policy in the State Department. He is a speechwriter of the famous Adlai Stevenson, that is famous if you were around in the 1960s, and he authored numerous books and was a professor of political science in Johns Hopkins University. He had a massive funeral in the DC area, and it was attended by many, and you could attend the funeral and have no idea what he did for a living. Everyone spoke about not his achievements, but rather the way he acted in his life. How he was a fantastic father, a caring uncle, a beloved grandfather. That's what they spoke about. That's what they said during his funeral. That's what they said afterwards. That's what they said during his period of mourning. All that matters in the end is how you are remembered. The eulogy virtues and the eulogy values. I was very intrigued after 9-11. I wrote a book. I never published it, and I suspect I never will, but it has a real spiffy title. I wrote a book about those who perished in 9-11, because every day the New York Times would publish uh, obituaries about those who died 
and the World Trade Towers. It's very interesting that there was a significant number, a disproportionate number of firemen which died in the World Trade Towers because normal people, when they see a fire, they run from it. When a fireman sees a fire, they run into it. So a disproportionate number of firemen who perished. So I read their obituaries, and I have nothing against New York's bravest. They're wonderful people. I admire them deeply. However, their obituaries would have made me extremely uncomfortable. One talked about how one could expectorate further than anyone else in the neighborhood. Expectorate means to spit. Another fireman was able to finish a six-pack. A six-pack is not just what's on your belly. It's six cans of beer faster than anyone else. I'm troubled that this is how people are remembered after they're no longer here. The rabbinic sages teach that a man is known by three names. The one that his father and mother call him, the one that his fellows call him, that's how people talk about him, and the one that he acquires by the way that he lives. And the last one is the most important of all. And here's an obvious example, and here again I'm grateful to Rabbi Joseph Tulishkin. Oscar Schindler was a very problematic individual. He was a boozer, a dishonest businessman, a womanizer, a loan shark. There's no end to things that he did that were wrong. But at that critical time during the Holocaust, he saved nearly 1,200 Jews. And forever after, his name will be synonymous with heroism, bravery, courage, self-sacrifice, synonymous. Like Vaseline means petroleum jelly, and Q-tips means cotton swabs, and Kleenex means tissues. Q-tips means cotton swabs, and tissues means Kleenex. Schindler changed his name. He's been associated with heroism self-sacrifice. And the truth is, after the war, he went back to his bad ways. But he's always remembered as being that heroic individual. And we, too, can change our names. To be a good person, environment plays an extremely important role. The obvious proof would be that when people are looking for a home, their primary concern should be, what are the people like in that neighborhood? Because these are the people that are going to impact upon you and certainly, certainly impact upon your children. Children be much more influenced by neighbors with whom they play with than what parents are telling them. That's just the way it is. And we know that bad behavior is far more puissant and influential than good behavior. Far more kids are influenced to go on to drugs by a bad influence than kids will be influenced to go off drug, drugs by a good influence. A significant motivator in doing the right thing, the Talmud teaches, and Maimonides, Maimonides codifies this in the Laws of Repentance, is to view the world as even, like a scale, exactly even. Do one more good deed, and you've tipped the scales for good. You tip the scales of good for yourself, for your community, and the world at large. Look at how much significance there is in every single act. And this should be the motivator for voting. People think, what's my vote going to make a difference? So many millions of people vote. But you have to think that your every act could make a difference. It could tip the balance. So. I'll end off with a famous story, which probably most of you know. It's, I don't know, a fable, a legend, but it's a good story. And it's the story of that an old man was on the beach, and he saw a little boy come by. It was after a storm, and all these starfish had washed up on the beach. And this little boy was throwing the starfish back into the sea. And the old man says, what are you doing? He said, when it comes noon and the sun comes out, these starfish, they'll die. He said, but there's thousands of them. What difference could it make? And he lifted up a starfish and he said, at least for this one, it'll make a difference. You might not be able to change the entire world, but at least all of us can change a small part of it for someone. And that's the mindset we have to have, that every single act can tip the difference for the good. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you for sharing, for subscribing. Bring your friends. The more we see, the happier we are. Thank you to see you again. Thanks for listening to Tell It From Jerusalem, where this series takes a never-fail approach how to inculcate good character. Spread knowledge by giving us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe. Join us next time for a brand new episode, and be sure to visit tellitfromjerusalem.com. You can find more details about this show and other useful information. Check out the site store, and just by inserting the TFJ code, you will receive an additional 10% discount off the already very reduced price of all Hanoch Tele products, books, lectures and documentaries. And remember, don't forget.
You can get Tell It From Jerusalem on any podcast platform or go to tellitfromjerusalem.com. Please see our YouTube channel for a richer than just audio experience with spiffy visual components and elements, also accessible from the Tell It From Jerusalem website, where the list of general and specific credits are listed. <laughs>